Thank you, sir. OK, it's my pleasure and privilege to be here talking with you today. I'd like to talk about resilience, but it's not of individuals or societies or institutions. It's about an ecosystem, and one that's very important in many, many respects. It, coral reefs are diverse. They're fascinating, beautiful places. But a lot of people around the world depend on them. There's estimated about 500 million people rely on coral reefs for various reasons, often for food. In the Pacific, it's a major source of protein for many people. Sometimes 90% of the protein can come from a coral reef. And in developed countries like Australia, we estimate between $1 and $4 billion per year from people visiting Australia associated with the Barrier Reef. So it's an important structure, and it's one that people have often looked at as being a really good example of resilience, because a coral reef like this, this is the Barrier Reef, it looks beautiful. If a cyclone comes through or a storm, it devastates the reef, it knocks off all the corals, it looks a mess, but if you go back 10 years later, it's regenerated. It's got an amazing capacity to bounce back. So in a system like this with very strong resilience and a really nice example of how ecosystems can rebuild themselves, how come there's places on the Barrier Reef like I'm going to show you now? This is a photograph of part of the Barrier Reef that's highly protected. Scientists have trouble getting in there, but it is part of the system. Now, this is not what we put on postcards, but it is part of the Barrier Reef. Now, these are uh, macroalgae. They're, they're a particular problem. And once they get established, we, we find that they, they're able to hold on quite well. So this brings to the fore the question of, well, what's resilience really look like? Can you see resilience? Can you measure it? And can you get the flavor of what a, a resilient ecosystem would look like? Is this a resilient ecosystem? Why do we get this on the Barrier Reef if the Barrier Reef is in such good shape? So it made me think about how resilience looks. And for me, that looks resilient. Now, that guy there, he'd be able to fight the bullets would bounce off him, the swords would glance off. This is a resilient looking piece of person. Now, the problem is, if you were sent back in time and stood next to him, you'd realize you've got an advantage. He does have a chink in his armor because he can't run. He can't catch you. Stand next to him, you can run away. He has trouble. If he wants to catch you, he's got to get on a horse. So for him, a horse was important. And that brings to the fore one of the questions about resilience, and that's mobility. And the reason for this is that coral reefs don't move. They're like castles in the sea. They're stood there, they're stoic, and they have to take whatever the world gives them, and they've got to learn to cope with it. And one of the big challenges today is coping with those algae. So how is a reef going to protect itself when it's stood in place against the algae that's coming from up current or wherever it's coming from? The key to this is these beasts. So these are parrot fishes, and there's a number of fish that do similar roles. And what these do is they keep the reef clean. They remove all of the algae. They're basically like the equivalent of the, the white blood cells in your, our body. If there's something that invades, they rush around and find it, kill it, and they keep the system clean. What these do is they keep the system clean in terms of grazing the surface. So the surface of reefs, about every 18 days, every little bit of reef is scraped and all the algae removed. So it's like having a home cleaning service. And these are good because this particular species, not only does it look nice, but it also cleans up dead corals. So if corals die for whatever reason, these beasts move in, and as they're feeding, they remove a little bit of the coral each time. And it produces about one ton of material per year as the cleaning process. So what it does is it takes in about a mouthful of coral. There's a second set of jaws in the throat. It grinds it up. It goes through the body and drops out the back end. Now, when it drops out the back, so when you go to the Barrier Reef and you're sitting in the sand cave and you're running your hands through the sand, <laughs> yeah, you're ahead of me. Uh, <laughs> the answer is yes. Uh, but don't worry, it's organic, so it, it's OK. Um, so these things, they clean up the reef, and they, that's where they put it. So the, the nature of this interaction is quite important. It's one that's been around for quite a while. So what these are are photographs of uh, fossil fish. And they're about 50 million years old. Now, in the, world of, uh, in, the, in the marine world, 
uh, there's been major changes through time. Now, the, one of the famous ones on land is the KT boundary. 65 million years ago, asteroid impact hit the land, the world changed, um, probably there was no photosynthesis for about six months, the dinosaurs died. We all know about the dinosaurs dying. That was a big event on land, but there was even bigger catastrophes in the water. So the wet stuff really suffered. And what happened is all the major groups that were there previously pretty much died out. And when things bounced back, we ended up with a new kind of fish, including these. These are herbivorous fishes. So after this KT boundary, this magic boundary, we had a different way of reefs existing. There was always this constant, intense grazing. Now, this grazing to start with was a bit of a challenge. In many ways, it's a bit like a, a well, it was a real challenge. It started off, it was a bit of a threat, very difficult to cope with, and eventually, the reefs became dependent on these herbivores. It's a bit like a drug or marriage. It's a challenge to start with, and eventually you get dependent. <laughs> now, <laughs> imagine what kind of mess you'd be like if you'd been dependent for 50 million years. So, it might feel like that for some, but... Uh, <laughs> For reefs, that's the situation they're in. They need these fishes. It's no longer a case of they're desirable, they're absolutely essential. So this fish delivers the most important process on reefs. It keeps them clean, it keeps them in good condition. So what we wanted to do is, because they're like the, the white blood cells, we wanted to go out and find just exactly how far do they have their influence and how important are they spatially. So, in a way, I'm like a, a, a one-person PR machine for fishers. But the, I wanted to demonstrate how important they are. So how we did this is we went to the Barrier Reef. This is Orpheus Island. This is where I do my work. We go to this location, and we go and catch fish. So what we do is we get nets. We go out there like this, and we catch them live, and we implant tags. Now, the implantation is like you see in the movies. So you know when you get somebody and they've got a spy and they want to track him and they stick a little thing in his arm and away you go and you can do a GPS and look at every location that he goes to? Well, that's exactly what we do for the fish. We implant these transmitters. The little red arrow there shows you how big they are. We put them inside the peritoneal cavity and then we put them back on the reef and we follow them. And the beauty of this is we can follow their exact location. Now, I did this work with Justin Welsh. It's very uh, hard. Um, someone has to be in the boat 24 hours a day, tracking these fish every minute of the day, day in, day out, week in, week out. So that was his job. Um, <laughs> so here he is in a canoe, following the round. We've got a GPS machine, locates the exact position of these fish. Now, what we wanted to show was just how spectacularly good they are how they roam around, because these are called roving herbivores. They move over the reef and they keep the reef clean. The area that these fish went to was that big, something like 8,000 square meters. It's about five to 10 times the size of this building we're in today. It spends its entire life, 14 years, in that little area. It was quite shocking. We, it, in some ways, it was a little bit depressing, because it means that these weren't as good as we thought they were. So the obvious answer is, well, you got the wrong fish, David. You should have looked at schooling fishes. You should have known better. So we went back and we did it with schooling fishes. So we go and we catch these fish. Now, they're good at not being seen. There's 30 fishes in that particular slide. Three species, they're good at hiding. We caught an entire school. In fact, we caught several entire schools and we put the transmitters into every individual. We then went back and we tracked how far the entire schools moved. And what we found to our surprise was that they didn't move much at all. About 0.24 square kilometers. And that's about twice the size of those single individuals. So schools aren't going anywhere. But you know that they are. So am I lying? What, what, what on earth's going on? What's happening is that it's like a Mexican wave. You go to a stadium and the wave runs around the stadium, but nobody moves. All they do is stand up and come down. That's exactly what these fish do. When a school comes past, they join it for their little bit of home range, then back down again. The school moves on, but the individuals don't. So these things, even if they're schooling, don't move very far. So what it leaves us with is a, a, a bit of a problem in that we have a system where there's very, very little movement. But we wanted to know if this was all the time. So what we did is we tried to follow these things 
year round. So we put out a listening array. So we had an array of receivers. We put the tags in the fishes, and now we could follow them day in, day out for eight months. And this reminds me of you know, uh, what we were doing, talking about the other day with mobile phones, being able to track people through time. So we were tracking fish through time, and what we found again, and this is a, a result, this is work with Rebecca Fox, that she was able to find exactly where these fishes were, and they were at the same receiver almost all year round. They hardly ever moved. And the beauty of this data is we could track them going from one location to another. So this is exactly the same kind of thing that Joe was talking about, Joe Thorpe, in terms of the mobile phones, where you could track humans. And I remember thinking when he was talking about how you could track humans with mobile phones is that if they did it for me to be final proof I am the most boring person on earth, because um, I don't go anywhere. It's work, home, work, home. There's very, very little. But the beauty of that is I'm also almost exactly like these fish. They don't go anywhere. Restricted areas, two locations between the two of them. And in many ways, they're like me. So if I go, for example, from work to the supermarket, I always follow the same route. And it isn't efficient, it isn't logical, but I always do the same. And we worked out recently why I follow that route, and the answer is because that's the route I used to take to drop my daughter off at daycare 22 years ago. Uh, I, I'm stuck in my ways. I, I, you can tell from the hair. I didn't choose to look like Krusty the Clown. It just grows this way. Um, so this, this kind of, uh, yes, this study reveals more about me than I wish to tell. But anyway, um, it reveals a great deal about these fish. They have these very restricted locations. Now, in terms of network analysis, if you put it in, this kind of movement has characteristics. And the characteristics are that you have this kind of hub and spoke movement. And it has an inherent weakness. And the weakness is that it's vulnerable to targeted attacks. So if you go to a specific node and you remove the fish, that makes that area basically bereft of fish. We're able to fish places out just by going to one location. And that's precisely what we've been doing for these fishes around the world. Now, this is a couple of examples of why we've got problems on coral reefs. So the top left-hand fish, the, the big boy, that's Bulba Metapon. It's about a meter long, or a yard, and it removes five tons of material per year. A major factor in the ecological processes of reefs. It cleans reefs up, it controls weedy corals, it keeps the system in good shape. It is vulnerable to exploitation because of the nature of the way it moves. And in all likelihood, that has enabled people to wipe it out. This thing has been driven to local extinctions in many places in the Pacific. And in the vast majority of places in the Pacific that I went to, it is no longer ecologically significant. In other words, the numbers have been reduced so much, it's no longer functional. So we've got huge areas where the, the reefs aren't working the way they should. And the other kind of mobility that we're seeing being restricted is in larval fish. Now, coral reefs, they sit there, and larval fish come in, and they bring with them um, all of the good influences. So if you've got a reef that's having problems, you wait for the larval fish to come in, and they're going to be able to recolonize, and they, the reef will regenerate. The problem is that almost all the work we've done in the last 20 years has shown that larval fishes don't move anywhere near as much as we thought. So if you go swimming on a reef and you see a fish, the chances are that its parents are within 20 or 50 kilometers of where you are at that point in time. The individual itself arrived from the water column about one centimeter long, and it's been probably within 100 or 200 meters of that location for its entire life. They go nowhere. So what does this mean? Well, it means we have a problem with resilience. And the key to it seems to be movement or mobility. And this reminds me of this guy, still. Mobility was one of his problems. And his armor is no longer useful. As weapons got more powerful and bullets could shoot through the armor, the armor was dispensed with. The only things that we've retained from this guy is the salute, because he used to lift his visor to show his eyes. These days, we have a salute. It's the same motion. So we kept the motion. We got rid of the steelwork. And the other key thing that we kept was the thing he was sat on, his horse. 
because mobility is critically important. So mobility keeps on turning up in resilience. So when we're looking at coral reefs, we've got a new way of looking at them now. They are resilient, they are able to regenerate, but there are some weaknesses in there. And in terms of the weaknesses, it seems to revolve around this mobility. And what this does is it kind of gives a, a new way of looking at reefs. Now, one of the things that I think is a central issue in this, and this is the topic of biodiversity. People say reefs are really good because they've got high biodiversity. But I'm really kind of worried about what biodiversity means. Now, the argument would be that if you've got a reef with a thousand species, it's a lot more resilient and a lot more capable of maintaining itself than a reef with a hundred species. I don't think that's true. I think that the vast majority of specimens on a reef are nothing more than baubles on the tree of life. They're just beautiful, but they're not necessarily important for ecosystem function. All of the theoretical studies, if you get kind of animals and you add them, say you want to produce a farmyard and you have a chicken and then you add a cow, as you add biodiversity, you get more and more functions. It looks as if more species means more functions. But if you've got a farmyard with 2,000 species, as we've got on the Barrier Reef, 2,000 species of fish, and you lose 1,000 of them, will the thing collapse? And I think the answer is probably not, because there's perfectly good reefs running around the world with less than 1,000 species. The Red Sea runs on 250 species. So what is it that biodiversity does? I mean, does it in confer real resilience. I sit in my back garden in Australia, and it's spectacular. Lots of animals, really rich, lots of biodiversity. But why don't I feel secure? Why don't I feel more secure in my back garden about the future than I would if I was sitting in my back garden in England? There's a lot more biodiversity, but it doesn't seem to be doing that much in terms of keeping the system safe. So what I think is happening is that when it's biodiversity, we've got to be very careful how we choose the metrics. It's not biodiversity per se, the number, but something about the nature of it. And in terms of biodiversity, it's the quality, not the quantity, that really counts. And in terms of the quality of biodiversity, there's two things. It's got to do the right thing, and it's got to have mobility. And with that, I'll thank you, and it's been a great pleasure being here. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thank you.